All right, thank you very much. It's time to get started for our Wednesday night services here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, you're, uh, you're an honored guest. We ask if you would, before you leave here, is to fill out one of the cards on the uh, seat, on the back of the seat in front of you there, and leave it either in the seat or drop it off at the, uh, the booth back there, visual, audio visual booth. Uh, please remember in prayer, Rip Baxter uh, has been doing better, but his wife Kay is sick. Uh, no calls or visits at this time, but prayers are deeply appreciated. Also remember those mentioned in our church bulletin and the long list that appears up here. Uh, Craig is speaking in Western Kentucky Youth Camp tonight. Please pray for him and safe travels. Uh, the, uh, the work that was uh, scheduled at May Martin's on her ramp has been, uh, has been not postponed, but canceled. It's uh, evidently that work is being done as we uh, speak. Uh, if you would, though, uh, uh, Nancy, uh, her daughter Nancy, is asked uh, for the congregation to pray for her sister, Judy Brown. Uh, they have uh, found some more cancer in her, and... Uh, we, she just prays that they make the right decisions. Uh, is there any other information you all have? Okay. Uh, serving tonight, uh, Ben has the song. Uh, Presley has the uh, scripture reading. I have the, uh, the uh, devotional. And uh, Eric Nichols has the uh, uh, closing prayer. If you would grab a song book and be marking the invitation song number 915 915. As a reminder for the youth group, there will be a meeting at following class for those going on the mission trip at the end of July. After you've marked number 915, if you would turn to number 414, 414. We'll sing first, third, and fourth verses. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go.
a couple of uh, congregations that uh, Debbie and I have worshipped at uh, supported a man from uh, Nigeria, uh, Moses Akpanado, and uh, if he was here, I'd apologize because I probably didn't pronounce his name right, but uh, he was a young man when uh, missionaries found him over in, in Africa and uh, brought him here to, uh, to study. He was educated at uh, Vanderbilt University and uh, returned to Nigeria for his work. Uh, with the help of uh, supporting congregations here in the USA, uh, Dr. Moses built a Christian grade school. Uh, uh, with an overwhelming need, he soon had to build a high school and a hospital. From, uh, from there, he, uh, he built a college. Uh, of course, he, at, during this time, he raised his family. And uh, he told his children when, when they got old enough to uh, go to college, he told them he'd send them to the United States if, uh, if they promised that they would come home. And, uh, of course, they did. Uh, one time when he was in the U.S., he visited our congregation, and uh, he was telling about all the good things that were going on in, in Nigeria. And he said his... Uh, his country was beginning to accept Christianity and that uh, uh, someday that uh, they may have to come here and, uh, and evangelize our country. And uh, it kind of stuck with me and it has really got me interested in, in uh, doing uh, mission work abroad. Uh, in... Uh, uh, not long after that, I had an opportunity. My first opportunities was to go to Panama with uh, a, a congregation, and uh, I did a little help in building and uh, a little, uh, well, we, there was an orphanage needs there that they always need a lot of repairs. So, so uh, I, I used my, my building skills to down there. Of course, they had vacation Bible school and uh, nightly, uh, nightly talks, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, of course, after Debbie and I moved here to this congregation with uh, y'all going to Guyana, uh, I, I jumped on the, the bandwagon and started going there with uh, the group here, and uh, soon. Soon the group here will be, be heading out in less than a month, I believe, and uh, they will come back and we'll hear all of, about all the, the good things that they've done. And uh, uh, if you would, put the, put the picture up there. Sam and Ogden and I one day was uh, walking the streets of Good Hope and uh, I snapped this photograph, and he's probably the only one that's ever seen it since uh, since I took it. But uh, but he remarked, he says uh, says I believe there's a lesson in that. So uh, I'm going to uh, present a, a short lesson on this photograph here. This uh, this photograph here could. Uh, could represent our, our daily lives. The ropes holding this beast could represent the responsibilities we've taken on. They just can't get things done on time and without me, or they can't cook or wash their clothes. Believe me, they can. Your family may even enjoy some time, some time without you there. When they come back, they're going to be calling for people to go next year. This year, I believe there was a, kind of a small crowd that that uh, decided to go. So uh, I thought I'd use this platform tonight to uh, start uh, trying to get people ready and signed up to go next year. Uh, I'm unable to go this year, but I, I do plan on, on going next year. Another another reason why people don't don't go and, and risk going out on 
on mission trips is is uh, they're afraid that they can't teach the Bible. Uh, that's not a good excuse here. The, the men and women that have gone in the past will help you to learn how to teach people on one-on-one -on -one Bible studies and give you the opportunity to teach people. And that they're very easy to learn and easy to understand. At the same time, this uh, photo could represent our spiritual lives. Uh, sometimes sin, like the ropes here that prevent this, this beast from moving, are like sin. They sins that prevent us from doing what God wants us to do. The burden often prevents us from living a fruitful, peaceful life that surpasses all understanding. I ask you that you keep in mind and keep in your prayers the people that will just be leaving here in the next on this next uh, Guyana mission trip. They certainly need it, and if you if you have any uh, desire or need or thought that you might be interested in going to Guyana, that now is a good opportunity. Now is the time to get started. Now is the time to to plan ahead. If you would. Keep these, uh, this group of people in your prayer. And if there's, if the sins like the, the ropes that are holding this beast back have burdened you so that you need the prayers of the congregation here, I, we ask that you will come at this time as we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of Father, we humbly bow before you this evening with hearts full of gratefulness and full of honor 
For you are the creator and giver and sustainer of all things that we have and all things that we ever will have, both material and spiritual, and we're grateful. Thankful, thank, thank you for the opportunity tonight to come to worship you, to hear lessons from your word and to study your word. Help us to focus on what each teacher has to present tonight and to not just hear the words, but help it to change our lives, to allow Jesus to wash over us, to allow his love and mercy and your love and mercy and grace wash over us and change our lives in ways that are meaningful and are in ways that we can serve you for all of eternity in heaven. We so earnestly long for and look forward to that day to hear enter in thy good and faithful servant and to spend eternity with you. Help us to make every decision in this life with that in mind. Please be with us as we go now to our classes and help us just to take this time and use this time wisely and learn from your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What do you think? Okay, is there a mute button? I'm not ready yet. Y'all go ahead. Um. (laughs) 
Well, I guess if y'all are going to get quiet, I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> All right. Uh, I appreciate Brother Wally's message. I appreciate also him clarifying, because I saw Craig's post about the West Kentucky Youth Camp, and I somehow read it that Brianna had sent him off to camp for a week. So I'm, gl I'm glad to understand that he's, he's up there speaking. That, that kind of helps clear up a little bit. Uh, I did want to go ahead and share with you the adult classes that will be starting not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So on uh, Sundays, beginning July the 1st, here in the auditorium, Timothy Good will be uh, teaching the book of Acts. Uh, downstairs, John Austin will be teaching life lessons from Proverbs. And then uh, Kevin Cottrell will be repeating his class of moral issues and Christians today. And that'll be downstairs, and I'll be repeating my class on Christian evidences in the fellowship hall. So if you miss those, or with my class, it's given me a second chance to get it right. So we're trying to, you know, uh, we're not changing our views on any of it, just let you know. We're, we're just going to try and do a little bit better, better job. So we'll have the auditorium class, uh, Book of Acts, uh, Moral Issues and Christians Today. Kevin will be in his the same room he's been in downstairs repeating that. I'll be in the fellowship hall, and then John Austin will be teaching a book of Proverbs. Then my understanding is, is that the Wednesday, that's July the 4th, we will have a special service because people are going to be gone and, and stuff. So we'll, we'll have a gathering here in the auditorium for the adults. Uh, details on that to be worked out. But then the Wednesday night classes will start the following Wednesday on the 11th. And they will then go through uh, October the 3rd. And that will be Jeremy Burleson here in the auditorium teaching a letter to the Hebrews. Uh, Brianna is teaching a ladies' class, The Names of God. Craig is teaching a men's class, The Names of God. Uh, and those will be downstairs. Uh, Brianna will be in whichever room she wants to be. Craig will be in the other one. Or, I, I assume. I assume. Uh, and then uh, Chris Kiefer will be in the fellowship hall with the letters to Timothy. So we'll have uh, those classes on Wednesday evening. Uh, I don't see a lot of those men I just named uh, in here right now. So uh, I guess they're teaching. I guess I guess so. They'll be figuring out what they're teaching once we start the quarter. So, anyway, but those are the classes that are that are, are coming up. Uh, the elders have asked me to start helping organizing the adult classes. Uh, so if you have suggestions on, I'll say topics, but I mean books or topics uh, that you would like to be have studied, or people that you think would be really good, and if you can match those up, that's even better. But it's not required. But if you have, if you think somebody would do a particularly good job of teaching a particular topic or book of the Bible, uh, please let me know, and we'll be glad to try to uh, work with that. Uh, my understanding is that I got this assignment. I'm still on probation as a new member. Carla's been accepted. That's all, but I, they're still working me through the uh, probationary clauses, and so this is kind of kind of helping me out with that. So anything y'all could do, I'd appreciate it because I like going to church with my wife. So. Uh, are there any additions to the prayer list? Wally asked, but are there any other names that we need to add to our prayer list? Yes, sir. Karen Clark, okay. Any others? Yes, sir. Julie? Julian. All right. Others? Okay. Let's uh, begin with prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time so we can gather, study from your word. We pray that the lessons that will be in your word we can take and apply to our lives and to let our light shine. Father, there are individuals that are on our hearts. We speak especially of Julian. We thank also of Karen Clark. 
Uh, we think of Craig as he is traveling, and we pray for any others that are enjoying summer vacations or time on business that they may be safe, that they may still let their light shine, and that they can come back safely to us so that we can worship together as a family here at Spring Hill. Bless us and keep us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, this evening, we are turning on the remote, and then we're going. All right. Well, I didn't realize I was beginning a series of classes when I said odd things from the Old Testament. Uh, last time we talked about snakes. Uh, this time, uh, last Wednesday night, Craig came up and said, hey, I'm going to be gone next week. You want to teach on uh, weird things in the Bible? Because, and if y'all remember, because in the, at the, he was closing out his class last week, he said, now things are about to get weird. And I didn't realize he was talking about me, but uh, hey, if the shoe fits, is the glare, this seems a whole lot brighter up here to me. Have we, new light bulbs. Here, let me help you all out just a little bit. That's, yeah, well, I'm, I want to let my light shine. It's the blinding the crowd that I'm concerned about here. I mean, it's, anyway, so Paul was on the road to Damascus, and now we know what blind. Anyway, anyway so uh, I think from the Old Testament, just seems like a, 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 a way I enjoy, and I hope you, you get benefit from, of looking at some of the things from the Old Testament that are just kind of not what we're used to. And I was talking with uh, Harlan about uh, the Bible Bowl that she's studying for, Book of Acts. Well, the uh, we have some experience with a different Bible Bowl, but same same concept. And uh, one year we did the Book of Leviticus. And man, if you want to talk about a fun book to teach to small children, now when you grab the bull and you slice the, you know, I mean, you're just... People were scared of Revelation. Revelation was a great study because it was all the imagery, and they, you know, they got the the pictures. So that wasn't a problem because you don't have to understand it; you just had to be able to tell the answers back. But looking at odd things in the Old Testament, one of the things that I'd like for us to look at tonight are frenemies. Now, I was like, well, that's obviously just a modern, made-up word. No, it's in Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Uh, one who pretends to be a friend, but is actually an enemy. So it's a frenemy. That's one of those, they're not really a friend, but it's convenient sometimes to act like it. You may work with some like that. You may interact with some like that. You might go to church. No, but, you know, it's, it's somebody who acts like, they're being civil and nice to you, but their motivations may not be pure. Well, we find frenemies, not called that, in the Old Testament. Specifically, I want to look at David's frenemies. Two of them in particular come to mind, the Philistines and the Moabites. Now, the Philistines, I'll say that their starting condition of their relationship would be neutral to negative. If you think about boy David, the only reason the Philistines would have anything against him was because he was an Israelite, pre-Goliath. I mean, he's a shepherd boy, but because he's an Israelite, they'd be against him. Same thing with the Moabites. Probably never even heard of him. So, a neutral to a negative feeling about David, pre-Goliath. Okay, now let's move on. First Samuel, First Samuel chapter 17, if you want to turn in your Bibles. Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Sukkah and Azekah. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the Valley of Elah. Well, the Valley of Elah no, is basically where these two mountain ranges join, but it's not the classic V-shaped valley. It comes down and has a flat or relatively flat area between them. 
So it's like a dry creek bed through there where these armies are lined up, one army on one side, one on the other. And a champion named Goliath comes out. Now, this is a picture of at least one portion of the Valley of Elah. Not saying this is where the battle took place, but this is the kind of thing that we're looking at where you have, they'd be one on this side, one be over on this side, and you've got a pretty wide area in between there. So you've got them lined up, and the Philistines come out, and it's Goliath. And we know the story of Goliath. But think about it. You've got a man who's potentially, depending upon the size of a cubit and, and all that, he's huge. He's got to be huge for the weight armor that they talk about he has. So whether he's nine foot six or not, I'm not worried. He's bigger than the average person, and he's carrying some heavy, potentially... 200 pounds of armor. The spear that he carries, the shaft of it probably weighs around 17 to 20 pounds. I'm thinking like a 4 by 4 that he's got. Plus whatever the weight is of the spear on the end of it. So, he's big. Do we know of any giants today? You start looking in the NBA or the NFL, you got some guys there, but there's one that always comes to my mind. You see these pictures of David and Goliath? No. Andre the Giant from one of my favorite movies, The Prince's Bride. Oh, and you see pictures of him together and holding things in his hand, and it, you know. But to me, that's always the image that I have of Goliath, is Andre the Giant. Not quite that nice, but still. So you got the giant coming out, and notice what they do. First thing they do is they start doing trash talk. Now, can we relate to that in modern times? Absolutely. You get two guys facing off against each other, and what are they going to be doing? They're going to be trash talking. And Goliath's calling them out and making fun of them, and I defy the armies and give me a man that we can fight. And Saul and his people are like, no, no, we're not, we're not interested in that. David comes, and he hears the taunts, and he's like, why isn't somebody out there fighting him? And I think here's the key: is they felt like they were the army of Saul. Maybe even the army of Israel. Notice chapter 17. In verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He was fighting for a whole different army than all the others were. If my faith was just in Saul, who was also a big man, remember he was head and shoulders taller than everybody else at the selection event, and obviously was a good-sized man, and, and David goes, no, I'm fighting for Saul. I'm in the army of God. Well, as we go through this, we see them preparing, and David goes to Saul. Verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put the bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. You know what I always assumed? This is little boy David. He couldn't fit in a grown man's armor. You realize that's not what it says? It doesn't say it didn't fit. It said he hadn't tested it. 
It's entirely possible. It fit him fine. So what does that say about the size of David? Pretty close to the size of Saul. I'm not going to force that issue. Not mandatory entrance exam to heaven. But it doesn't say that it didn't fit him. It just says they hadn't tested it. And right after this, Saul says, I don't recognize him. You ever seen a teenage boy grow a foot overnight? I am dreading going back to school for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is the students I had last year, I'll have a bunch of them again this year. And those, they'll change over the summer. And that's not right. Because I remember them from last year. I don't know them this year. But I think that could be part of it is David's growing into David's not, I mean, he's fought a bear and a lion. He's not going to be a scrawny little kid. He goes in. Any of you that are nerds like me, I encourage you to do a Google search on the physics of David killing Goliath. Thankfully, this is a wonderful physics experiment of having, would the, slo the stone that was in the sling travel fast enough to literally go through the skull of a, of a person? And physics says, absolutely. And it wouldn't have to be that big a stone because they were so good with the slings that they could get the right speed, the right aim, to be able to hit somebody in the forehead and it go in. So, do I believe God miraculously guided that stone? I don't know. David had plenty of practice. Maybe God gave him plenty of practice to get him ready. I think God prepared him one way or the other, either in the practice or, or this time. Either way, I'm good. But that stone goes in and and people are going, well, but see, Saul, uh, uh, Goliath falls forward. He's running downhill. If you get hit in the head or anywhere else, which way are you going to fall if you're carrying 200 pounds of armor? You're going to fall forward. Now, does his head fly back? Maybe so, but there's nothing wrong with him falling forward. Now, we've gone through all this because now David's going to kill Goliath or finish killing Goliath by taking his head off. So what's his condition now? With the Philistines, I'd say a strong negative. <laughs> you just killed our champion. And I understand their position. That, that's, that's hard to take. For the Moabites, I don't know, but I bet it's complicated. Because they're going to be kind of scared of David that he was able to defeat that champion. But I'm betting they're also kind of happy we don't have to deal with Goliath anymore either. You know, if if our enemy kills one of our other enemies, I'm good with that. But it's kind of complicated for the Moabites. Now the story advances. We go through Saul's hatred for David. He flees from Saul. He then have the friendship of David and Jonathan. And then we come to chapter 21. So we still got Philistines, strong negative. Time has passed. We don't know exactly how long, but time has passed since the death of, of Goliath. But still, they're going to remember it. Both sides will remember it. Because what are they singing about David? He's killed his 10,000. Saul's only killed his thousands. So they already got songs writing about David. Moabites, I'm figuring they're kind of back to a neutral. To, uh, he's an Israelite. Now then, David flees at the end of chapter 21, beginning in verse 10, flees to Gath. Now what's significant about the Philistine city of Gath? Yeah, that's Goliath's hometown. Okay, that seems a little brazen to me. Especially because right before this, David has gone to the priest, Ahimelech, and said this is where they eat the, the, get the, the showbread. And David and his men eat that. And he says, do you have any weapons or anything here? And they go, well, yeah, we got Goliath's sword that you took. 
So David takes Goliath's sword, assumingly, I'm going to put it, on his hip or on his back or somewhere, and walk into Goliath's hometown. Really? <laughs> yeah, or brothers, or, I mean, you know, something. Or, you know, there's got to be a new champion who's come up that goes, hey, I hear what you did to that. So David is there in the city of Gath, thinking that Saul won't chase him. And I bet he's right. But I wouldn't be concerned about Saul at this point. I'd be concerned about the Gathites, the Gathians, the, anyway, yeah, them. So he gets there in verse 11, the servants of Achish, the king of Gath, said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So seemingly he was going to approach the king of Gath and go, hey, can I have refuge here? But now, pretty quick, the advisors are going, uh, excuse me? <laughs> we don't need him here. I love this passage. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended madness in their hands because the custom at the time was if someone was out of their mind, you didn't harm them. That, you, it's kind of like they're suffering enough. We don't need to do anything to them. So he fakes this, I assume, as a defense mechanism. He scratches on the doors of the gate and lets his saliva fall down on his beard. Where do you think David might have seen such behavior before? Saul. <laughs> What's Saul been lately? A raven maniac throwing spears at him and do, trying to kill him. So I, I think he's going, Psh, man, I can do this. I'm just going to act like Saul. But here we go. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I, had, have I need of madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? You realize what this is? Those advisors were exactly doing their job, saying, I don't think we ought to. And this turns into a job review on them. He goes, why do I need more madmen? I got y'all. And they're like, what are you? <laughs> we're helping out. David would have, up here have been some of the battles. Here is Gath down here. So David has fled quite a distance down to the town of Gath. And that's his welcome. Arrest him. No, he's insane. And get him out of here. I got plenty of y'all. But the frenemy part. He just killed their champion. Now let's go see if they'll let me stay there for a while. That's tough. All right. So Philistines, I'm going to say, are a strong negative and suspicious. Moabites, they're still the same. All right, now we're chapter 22. So he takes and begins to hide instead in a cave. And then in verse 3 of chapter 22, he goes from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come here with you till I know what God will do for me. So David is hiding in a cave because all those priests that helped him, Saul killed. Or Saul had killed. David instead flees to this cave. His family is now with him. Why would the family come to him in a cave? Why not just stay where they were? Yeah, if Saul's willing to kill the priest, he's not going to care about killing David's family. 
So whether they are truly involved in this or not, and scholars want to go different ways, but whether they're really supporting David or we're getting drug into this because of, of who you are, they're now there. And so David seeks asylum for his family in Moab. All right? Brief history lesson. Where did the Moabites come from? Who did they descend from? Lot and one of his daughters. The Ammonites came from Lot and his other daughter. So in an off long family history search kind of way, they're at least related. We just had our family reunion, and we every year we just decide we're first cousins or second cousins or third. We don't do the first cousins once removed, second cousins three times removed, and then brought back on a bus. Or, you know, we don't, we don't go into all that removed stuff. We're just willing to take them, you know, if they're rich especially. But, you know, so here we've got David goes to the Moabites. But is that David's real connection to the Moabites back through Lot and Abraham? What's David's other connection to the Moabites? Yes, ma'am. Through Ruth. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Abinadab. Abinadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. Ruth and Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So, Jesse's grandparents, grandmother, was a Moabite, Ruth. Now, was that enough to get them asylum? I don't know, but they got asylum. So why would David take them there? Well, I don't think taking them to the Philistines is going to work any better. You got Ammonites, Moabites. He's got at least a connection to the Moabites. So now, his relationship with the Moabites I'm going to go tolerable. Okay, we'll take your family. Philistines, <laughs> we're glad he's out of here. He's not our worry right now. So he's not now in a good relationship with the Moabites. Now then, 1 Samuel 23, going through 2 Samuel 7. He flees Saul. He saves Saul's life. He marries Abigail, which is a whole interesting story on the joys that a wife can do in preserving her husband. There's much discussion that her husband's name, Nabal, which means that fool, uh, was not necessarily given to him by his parents, but was a term of endearment from his buddies. Or, so, you know, so you're kind of hoping, you know, that, that the parents don't go, oh, just go ahead and name him, you know, thou fool. Uh, but David asked for food, has some justification in asking for it, obviously turned down. He's ready to attack. And Abigail comes and says, wait a minute. Now, Nabal was a Calebite. What tribe were the Calebites? They were attached to the tribe of Judah. So what would David's status be with the tribe of Judah if he attacked and killed a Calebite over nothing more than he wouldn't share his food with? He would, be, he would mess up his whole relationship with the tribe of Judah. So, yes, Abigail saved Nabal's life until Nabal found out about it and then fell over in a, in a, in a fit and, and died. And then Abigail marries up. But she saved him from shedding innocent blood that would have destroyed politically his ability to be king over Judah. As many wives continue to do. Once again, they have saved our worthless hides. So, 
Then he goes back to the Philistines. You got to wonder about the Philistines that keep going, yeah, sure, David, come on back. Well, the king of the Philistines says, hey, you're, you're pretty good fighting. Why don't you go out and raid the cities of Israel? And David goes, okay. So David and his men, 600 men or so, go out, attack, kill everybody, and then come back and say, yeah, we were in Judah today, wiped out a couple of cities. Well, they weren't in Judah at all, but so apparently David's got a little truth issue, but, you know, it is self-preserving, but he, he goes out and, and, and says, we just wipe out all the stuff and, and brings the stuff back. And so the king of the Philistines is going, I love this guy. Hey, we're fixing to go up and battle Israel and Saul. Why don't you come with me? And so David's like, sure. Now, I don't know what he had in mind. But they're parading, getting ready to go. And the Philistine lords get together and go, uh, I don't feel real good about having David back behind us when we're facing Israel on the front and we got King David here in the back. So the king has to come to him and say, I'm sorry, I can't let you go out and play. David's like, oh. So he and his men go off. This is the battle where Saul and Jonathan die. So David was almost there at that battle. What would he have done? Don't know. I'm thinking he had a plan. And it would not have involved the death of Jonathan. Saul, uh, I'm not taking bets on, but Jonathan, I'd, <laughs> I'd go, no. Saul dies. David's made king of Judah. David's made king of Israel. Philistines are still suspicious. Moabites, we really don't know what's going on with them. They kind of faded from the scene here. It's, it's mostly the Philistines and the Israelites that are going back and forth. Chapter 8. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and David took big word out of the hand of the Philistines. And he defeated Moab, and he measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. Two lines he measured to be put to death and one full line to be spared. And the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. We go from, will you look after my mom and dad to have your army lay down and two-thirds of them are about to be killed. We have no biblical indication of why. But I think the frenemy status got changed. Jewish history, Jewish teaching, not inspired, but historically, say that the Moabites killed David's family. And if you look at the people that David has in charge of his army, we can only find one brother that was a brother of David that is serving in his army as one of the captains or you know a, a leadership position. That doesn't mean it was the only one. That's just all we find record of. But I'll say that it had to be something significant for David to go from, will you watch over my family, to y'all lay down and this line and this line are getting killed and this line, all right, y'all get to live. Frenemies. People who act like friends but are actually enemies. In these situations, I'm going to say David was the frenemy, not the Philistines, not the Moabites. Now, are they without reproach? No, no, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. But this is part of what I don't get about politics 
inside a business. I am terrible at office politics. I don't know how to play. I thought we were there to work. I thought we were there to, you know, get something done, you know, whether it's make a product or provide a service or, you know, teach kids or, you know, whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing. I, I thought that's what we were there to do. You know, it's not. We're supposed to be seeing who can put the others down and, and, and rise up. And and that just, I, I'm just standing around going, what do you mean? By, what? I don't get it. And I don't see what it does for them. So, I turn into a professional brown noser. Because some of these people will just step and fetch and do everything they can for the person that's, you know, higher up the chain. And they'll just, just you know, just... And so whenever, you know, like the principal calls for me to come to the office, which is not unusual, but not always a bad thing. And so when I get, it's, it's about a six minute walk from my room to the principal's office. I mean, even walking at appropriate speed. But when I'm within the last 30 feet, there's a corner that I turn where then suddenly you can see it. So I'll be walking along. And then when I get to that corner, I take off like I've just been running the whole way, man. You know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. She said, did you arrive? I said, well, you need it. You needed me. I wanted to get here quick. And the people who are doing this to try to really help themselves hate me. And I don't care. That's not what I'm there for. I'm there to keep my job. Not for the salary, but for the insurance. I need that. But frenemies. You start looking at this and you go, well, did David know how to have a friend? Oh, look through there at he and Jonathan. There's no frenemy there. Oh, the psalms that are written about it. The, the, the sayings that they had to each other. And oh, yes, David had faults. Absolutely. Jonathan, I'm sure, had faults. We don't read about much of it. But you just got to love Jonathan figuring out, I'm not going to be the next king. By lineage, I would be. But I'm not. And David, I can't wait to serve in your court. Because that's God's will. Oh man, this, this is good. I mean, what's better than being king? Having your best friend as king. You don't have the responsibility, but you get a lot of the benefits. I mean, that's a good deal, I hear. And Jonathan's like, oh, I'm looking forward to this. That's a friend. And we need to be friends, not frenemies. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time together. We pray, Lord, that we may take these lessons and remember them, that we can be a friend to our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can be a friend to the lost, and help to bring them to you. Bless us, Lord, in all that we do the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen.